Good evening, everyone. We're going to call Recording in progress. Good evening, everyone. We're going to call the Malden School Committee meeting to order. Today is Monday, October 4th, 2021. The time is 6 o'clock p.m. Our next meeting will take place on Monday, November 8th, here in the council chamber at 6 p.m. As we mentioned at the outset of the school year, we will be doing this meeting in hybrid format. So obviously we are here in person, but members of the public who wish to attend remotely can do so using Zoom. What we will first do is we will pledge allegiance to our flag as we always do. We will then have a moment of silence for our veterans. Our clerk to my right to your left will then call the roll and we will get into this evening's agenda, which consists of the following. Uh, approval of minutes, public comment. We'll then hear from our superintendent, who's gonna talk about the Malden Public Schools partnership with Malden Reads, where we are on enrollment, uh, the updated calendar, and Indigenous Peoples Day proclamation, district updates and highlights in general. There is nothing under subcommittee reports and discussions as of now. Uh, under motions and resolutions, Mr. Welder will talk about changes, proposed changes to our residency policy. Then we will entertain any motions of personal privilege before we enter into executive session, depending on a vote of the school committee. In executive session, we will aim to approve the minutes of September 13th, uh, we are also going to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with units A, B, and C because having an open meeting will have a detrimental effect on our bargaining position. The same will go for SEIU local 888 clerical unit because that too by doing it out here will have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the school committee. We will then return to public session where we may or may not vote on what we did in executive session. Regardless, after that's over, we will then move adjournment again until we return November 8th. Uh, one other note this evening, uh, we typically have translation services available, but we are in between companies, so we will not have that available tonight. Uh, we will aim to have that back at our November meeting. So if there are no questions from the members, why don't we first pledge allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you would, please remain standing for a moment of silence in honor of all those who have fought for our country and continue to do so today. Thank you. We will now have our clerk take attendance to ensure that we have enough members here to conduct business. Mayor Christensen? Yes. Mr. Trummy? Yes. Mr. Froyo? Mr. Mr. Froyo? Okay. Mr. Gray? Yes. Mr. Ivan? Ms. Luong? Yes. Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Superintendent Noriega Murphy. 
All right, so we have a quorum sufficient to allow us to meet this evening. Let's get into the agenda. The first item is the approval of minutes. So these are the regular session minutes of September 13, 2021. Motion by Mr. Ivino, seconded by Mr. McCarthy. So any questions, everybody's had a chance to read them over. Hearing no questions, all those in favor say aye. Nine. Yes, have it. That carries unanimously. We're now down to public comment. This is where we go over to Mr. Weldy, who will lead us on how public comment will work this evening. The only thing that we would ask that you do is if you are going to speak, just state your name and address for the record. And please keep your remarks to just a couple of minutes. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. If any uh, members of the public would like to speak who are in person, just please come on up to the podium to do so. If anybody who is on Zoom would like to speak, uh, please just use the raise hand feature to indicate uh, your intent. Uh, or if you are on the telephone, dial star nine to raise your hand. You can also put your name and address in chat. Please. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Christelle Jean, and I am a senior at Malden High School. Um, I wrote a statement just a couple minutes long. I hope that's not going to be sure. an issue. Yeah. All right. Um, this may seem out of the blue to many members of the community, but I just want everybody to keep in mind um, this is in regards to the initial school committee meeting. Um, where I had spoken with a few friends of mine and we created the hashtag represent me campaign. And for a few years, it has been circulating around Malden. And this will be my final address of that event. All right. Um, so I wanted to start out by thanking everybody here for allowing me this space one last time to speak. I intend to thank you all by providing my genuine, unfiltered truth this time. I believe I have done the community a disservice by not leading in the truth in my initial address three years ago. Finally, before I begin, I want to provide a sensitivity warning for any young black indigenous POC who does not want to hear or see the frustration and pain they experience constantly to be reflected at them in this moment. You do not need me to walk you through this. We live in it daily. Initially, my intentions for coming to this space were to settle a score. You see, three years ago when I was 14 years old, I mustered all the courage in my little body that I could to come speak here to all of you. I spoke alongside a few friends of mine about our experiences with racism in the Malden public school system. I was so beyond thankful that I did not do this alone, especially considering what followed our address. After this day, we were met, of course, with much praise for our courage and eloquence and our ability to be so strong. Looking back, these voices were a smooth, calm surface covering the turbulent waters that lay stirring just below it. After the shock value of being faced with the consequences of their own actions, the educators of the Malden Public Schools, particularly the Salemwood School, began showing just how troubled the storms to come would be. Unbeknownst to us, up ahead, laid out for us were years of passive aggressive behavior, denial, people refusing to believe our stories, calling us liars, whispering behind our backs when we roamed the halls, groups forming on social media specifically made to make us become some disgruntled group of teens looking for attention. Of course, we cannot also forget the blatant displays, like teachers coming up to us in our free time to make sure we knew how disgusted they felt by us, or following the school committee meeting where we were berated by a, school, by a Salemwood school staff member. Because of this, I learned just how powerful white fragility is. Now I take this time to say, anyone who is not a part of this behavior should have no reason to feel called out. Though I believe it is clear what my intentions are, I have learned that I have to specify that if this is not about you, if you did not participate in this, and if you did not enable this behavior, this is not regarding you or your actions. For those of you who do feel called out, I want you to sit in this moment and relive what it felt like to be textbook bullies as adults to a group of children. I used to wonder if it felt like victory for you, 
if you gained joy and release every time you whispered our names. I would come home from speaking at a diversity meeting or a local rally or even Harvard once. I would sit in my bed and ponder if this was all worth it. Was speaking my voice worth the brokenness it left me to sit in? Was I really doing the right thing if I was causing this much hatred to be invoked from people? Why was it so wrong for me to speak my truth? What could I have possibly said to make so many people hate me so much? You have to understand, this was admittedly the most terrifying thing I had done at the time. My entire life I had abided by the ideology that authority figures deserve the utmost respect. The best way to give this, I thought, was my unwavering silence and obedience. Following this rule, I became a model student worthy of praise and adoration for my ability to understand and follow rules. I was told how appreciated and valued I was, that I would always have the support of the figureheads around me because I had earned it. Before this, I had no idea how conditional this support was. I had no idea that when push came to shove, they would choose to protect their white fragility over my humanity. I have been plagued for the last three years with the burden of being people's storage unit for their negativity. Every time, and I do mean every time things died down, it was never for long. At least once a year, I have had to relive everything I felt and experienced without the chance to defend myself. Unfortunately for many people, I am now done being a waste space for ignorance. I am currently learning that I am by no means responsible for how people act out of their own ignorance. In my attempts to protect the feelings of the white people around me, I neglected my own psychological safety. As I did, I did not, as I said, I did not come here to settle a score today, nor did I come to offer peace of mind to the white educators of this school system. I am here to plead with the BIPOC of this community. I offer myself to you as a lesson. Do not become so enraptured with the hostility of those around you that you neglect your own peace. It is not your job to fix people into understanding that you have value as a human being. You absolutely deserve to have a space where you feel safe and at rest from outside forces. To my fellow black and brown students, I apologize to you. I'm sorry that with the little time I have left as a senior, I cannot lead you anymore on this basic quest for a simple, safe space at school. I promise that I will continue to be with you, fighting and speaking our truth as we are not done yet and likely won't be done anytime soon. I have happily given my time, energy, and heart for this mutual desire of ours, but I can no longer sacrifice my mental well-being if I intend to leave here somewhat intact. I am sorry you had to suffer at the hands of people unwilling to love you unless you fit the mold of a model minority. To the true allies I have encountered in the Malden public school system, I expect that you will be here to shield and guide the students in this battle, especially after I am gone. You have the respect and understanding of your peers that I could not gain in a lifetime. You have been left with all the necessary tools to build these safe havens for your students. I only ask that you take the time to listen to them when they come to you, that your love for them as an educator is not conditional. I leave with the message of love and hope that we can lead with this in the future. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Um, Seeing any other hands from the public or any hands on, here we go, let's got one on Zoom. Uh, Lily. Hi, can you see me? I can't see me. Uh, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh no, are you supposed to be able to see me? <laughs> it's more important to hear you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Lily. I am a math assistant at Linden Steam. Um, so I'm a part time worker. Um, I, I had some things. Oh, you can see my how do I I see now what you can see. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Um, I came here tonight because I've been trying to get the policy for um, the COVID sick leave changed for part time workers because currently the policy was that part-time workers would not be paid for uh, time off due to COVID, but I realized that the, um, the uh, governor extended the uh, emergency sick leave law a few days ago. And so um, I talked with the mayor tonight, so I am not sure exact, like it's, we, we think that it 
should apply to part-time workers, but I'm here just to bring it to everyone's attention because I also haven't um, since then, it was renewed last Wednesday, and since then I haven't received any information from HR from the school, so I'm not sure um, how, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what's to be done from here, but yeah, I'm just here to make sure that that would definitely apply to part-time workers, and I had some things written down, but I think a lot of them are moot points now, so um, yeah, I, I'm if you if you have any questions for what I just said, go ahead, or if you have other things to say, but thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, going once, seeing no other attendees on Zoom, and seeing none in the public, uh, we can consider that portion of the agenda closed, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Weldy. Now let's hear from our superintendent. Again, this will be about our partnership with Malden Reads, where we are in enrollment, updated calendar, which includes Indigenous Peoples Day proclamation, and then just generally speaking, what's happening across the district. Uh, this is a joint presentation. So I will go on the other side with the partners. Good evening, everyone. Most people know that I don't even need a mic, but I'll try it with the mic. Um, good evening, honorable members of the school committee. It is our honor to be here tonight to present to you the new plans for the school year of 2021 and 2022 that we have created with the superintendent, Dr. Noriega Murphy, and we co-facilitated Jody Zalt and our committee. As we all share our love for reading and the passion to connect students to our great Malden community. Before we present the new and exciting plans for the school year, we would like to recap some of the things that we have done to show you that we really have the capacity to really bring us all together. Malden Reads has done this in par partnership with the Malden Public Schools. For many years, Malden Reads has given books to all Malden Public School students and as well members of the school committee and we expect to continue to do so. Even during COVID, we were able to provide copies of Born a Crime to all Malden High School students. Together with the Malden Public Schools literacy coaches, the High School Interact Club, and EL parents, we have invited authors to share their experience with our students, both in person and via Skype. We have also hosted movie nights and events that embrace the themes of the books that we read together. We have a partnership around literacy in our community Every year, Malden Reed selects a main book for the community to read. And in the schools, we select the same reading, but in an appropriate grade level version, and we provide class sets. Uh, this coming year, we are planning to provide poetry books to the high school in particular, around themes for the high school students. And we have hosted a mini writer's den for middle school students in our efforts to support their writing skills and also to support their transition to the Malden High School. Thank you. In our efforts to bring equity and literacy to our district and Malden Reads, we will ensure that all literature and activities reflect, are going to reflect the culture and linguistic diversity of our students and community. And in addition to continuing the annual activities, we plan for 2021 and 22 to establish a Youth Poet Laureate program and partner with the businesses and faith-based community organizations. 
showcase students' artwork and poetry, collaborate with the literacy and the EL directors to work with a fourth grade pilot program called m and And through that program, we will provide sample curriculum and space for broader cultural enrichment for students. We always want to develop skills for students to um, build their skills in problem solving and to interact with one another and have opportunities to have uh, community representatives to come in and so that they can learn how to reflect and interact. We will have mentors and mentees supporting the fourth grade program. And we will work with the literacy and the EL directors as well as with the Malden High School Alumni Association so that we will mentor high school students. We also want to integrate the visual and performing arts and literacy. So therefore, the Malden Public Schools Literacy and Art, Fine Arts Department, along with Malden Reads, are going to align resources to integrate visual and performing arts and literacy. We are going to select a book in middle school for middle school students, where students can create ceramic tiles and bring alive their reading. The goal is to have these tiles placed in uh, the early learning center and be displayed so people can actually see what students have been in, uh, transforming their visual thinking, their critical thinking into the art. We are also going to em emphasize poetry and the poetry will come alive when the students are going to have artistic displays on their deep interpretation of poems and integrating music to poetry. Thank you for your time. And we are very happy to take any questions that you may have. And we hope you'll participate in the future with many of our programs. All right, thank you. And now we're going to hear where we are relative to enrollment. Thank you to our new partners. Yes, we are going to be happy to do that. And we are going to hear from Lenny Iovino, school committee representative about district enrollment. Thank you very much, Superintendent Norie e. Murphy. Our current enrollment as of uh, this past Friday was 6,141 youngsters in the Malden Public Schools pre-K through grade 12. That is an increase from week to week of 79 students. Our enrollment has increased in excess of 300 students since the start of this school year. Um, we will hear in, in a short while from Assistant Superintendent um, Doherty, so I, I won't say too much except to say that there's a potential with the pending applications and those that have been completed where the youngsters will be uh, placed in schools within the next day or two for a potential of another 196 youngsters being added to the Malden Public School enrollment. So we will fast surpass where we ended up last year um, as more and more youngsters come back to school full time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iovino. Do you want to take any uh, questions first? Uh, any questions of the members? Uh, just uh, one from the chair, Mr. Ivino. That still is under where we were pre-COVID, but not by much, right? It's we're under where we were pre-COVID, yes, but not by a lot. Okay. Not by a lot. Okay. I think 52. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ivino. Now back to our superintendent to talk about the updated calendar. Okay. And before I start with the new calendar. I would ask Mr. Adam uh, Walde to actually uh, present the proclamation. Absolutely. Um, we are pleased tonight to be able to share um, the proclamation that uh, Mayor Christensen made on behalf of Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and I'm going to just read through it. It's not that long. Um, 
so a proclamation. Uh, whereas the city of Malden recognizes that the indigenous peoples of the lands that would later become known as the Americas are native to these lands, and whereas the city of Malden recognizes, values, and celebrates the many contributions made to our community, our commonwealth, and our country by indigenous peoples now and throughout our history, and whereas the city of Malden, in an effort to promote truth, healing, reconciliation, redress, and justice, recognizes and acknowledges the ongoing trauma and historical harms, acts of genocide, and violations of human rights of indigenous people, and whereas the city wishes to honor our local Massachusetts tribal heritage and our national indigenous roots, history, and contributions, and whereas the Massachusetts State Legislature passed a bill providing for the creation of a special commission to make recommendations for a new or revised state seal and motto, thereby reflecting growing momentum within both state and local government to redress the harm to indigenous peoples caused by the promotion of false histories, and whereas the city of Malden is one community open to all that celebrates and welcomes everyone, that is dedicated to promoting equity and justice in our city, and that is committed to policies and practices that seek to end systemic racism and dis discrimination. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Gary Christensen, Mayor, do hereby proclaim that the second Monday of October henceforth be commemorated in Malden as Indigenous Peoples Day, and the city of Malden recognizes the position of indigenous people as native to these lands and that Malden is indigenous land. And the city of Malden celebrates and honors the foundational contributions of indigenous peoples to the history of our city, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and our country. And finally, the city of Malden encourages our public schools to observe Indigenous Peoples Day with appropriate instruction to celebrate the culture, diversity, and history of indigenous peoples. In witness thereof, I hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Malden on the 16th day of September in the year 2021. And it's signed by our chair, Mayor Gary Christensen. Um, I know uh, on behalf of the committee, I know that this was presented to the city council last week um, and they uh, unanimously endorsed um, the proclamation. Um, if it pleases my colleagues, I would be more than happy to also make a motion uh, for us tonight to endorse uh, the proclamation that you've made uh, about Indigenous Peoples Day. So motion by Mr. Weldice, seconded by Ms. Luong. Any questions on that? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? The ayes have it, that carries unanimously. Okay, back to our superintendent. Thank you, and I think this is an amazing uh, moment to really realize that this changes the history of how we see people and how we acknowledge people. So thank you for doing that for the uh, city of Malden and also for the Malden Public School students because it reflects our diversity. So thank you for doing that. We also have the National Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, again, celebrating our different uh, group of students, faculty and staff, and also citizens of not just Malden, but United States. With those words, I want to acknowledge Christelle's words of encouragement and at the same time for bringing us back to the core of our work, and that is to focus on equity, approach to humanity, and at the same time that our job, our obligation, our moral obligation is to make sure that our students don't go through that type of suffering that we actually are going to open our hearts, our minds, when we embrace more and more the work of equity. Equity is not just a, it's a word, it's actually how we change the way that we think, we act, and at the same time how we interact with each other. So I just want to say that I acknowledge that, and that we, our job as educators is to protect and educate our young students and respect each adult in the building. So therefore, I'm going to move to the next celebration that we have in October, and that is the uh, month of preventing bullying, because what we experience sometimes, what we call racism, is also part of bullying. So please, when you hear things, react. Don't be a passive aggressive, because then we collaborate. We are part of that. So 
uh, I just have to say that these are three amazing uh, Connect the celebrations that we are very proud of. Uh, I'm going now with the old uh, calendar, so I don't know if you have seen uh, the new version of the calendar. And um, this is the old version. Uh, we added the colors, the information is still the same, but we actually, uh, we added in there that every uh, second Monday of October, we are going to write in our calendar the Indigenous Peoples Day to actually make it official in our uh, lives. Um, we realize, and thank you <laughs> to Michelle, notice that uh, we will have to revamp a little bit the back of the holidays. There were some typos in there, so my apologies for that. But we are very happy that um, we put color. So you are going to see more color in our lives um, every single day. And uh, I'm going to uh, go into the district enrollment data. And uh, thank you, Mr. Ovino, uh, for presenting the data. As of today, we have 6,145 students. Last time when I reported, reported, it was on September 9, it was 5,939. And on my first meeting on August 26, there were 5,770. So you will see it in there, our enrollment is increasing. Uh, then you have the enrollment data per school. And we are, we are actually keeping track of every single month uh, how the data changes uh, in every single school. Uh, we also look at attendance. And as of 9.30, that was September 30th, our total attendance as a district was 90%. Uh, we would love to see uh, our attendance going to 98%, but we know that we are still in the process of students uh, missing classes because they are sick and things like that. So hopefully we will get to that point. Uh, celebrations, we talk about the celebrations, we talk about the school calendar, data enrollments. And one thing that we are doing, uh, I would say daily, my team would say, well, it seems, it seems like it's every single second. We are monitoring attendance in different layers, and that is to make sure that we are not going to drop out students, that we are going to go and do home visits, trying to make sure that they stay in our system. We still are cleaning the data and trying to make sure that it's aligned with our goals and systems. Uh, we, you're going to hear very later on about COVID testing, vaccination, and also the updates on the numbers of the students and staff that had been uh, affected by COVID. In every single school, this is new information, we have met with the principals and we asked them to have the following school structures. One is a school committee, um, a school site councils. They had to have a parent site council. They had to have a parent and teacher organizations. And thank you, uh, I see that we, we have some representatives here from the uh, district PTO. It was amazing to meet with them uh, my second time. And next time we are going to hopefully have a massive celebration about what's going on in the districts and where parents and teachers are working together. We need to have a student government from grades K to 12, not just in the high school. The goal is to have monthly meetings with every president and vice president of school, uh, school government in order to uh, be able to hear a student's voice. Uh, instructional leadership teams that is formed by teachers and by administrators. A student support teams, professional learning communities, and um, this is more about the high school. We need to have a school committee, stu a student representative, and you are going to hear very soon for our, one of our amaz amazing principals. The data that we are also tracking right now is students who are a little bit off track to graduate. That means we are looking at students in ninth grade to 12 to see how many credits they are uh, attaining every day, every year, and how far they are from graduating. We are also going to start not looking at only ninth graders, but very soon we are going to engage in looking at seventh and eighth graders. We notice that uh, getting off track doesn't start just in high school. It starts early on. So we want to make sure that we are going to follow that information with students. Uh, you can see our criteria of how we are going to define off track youth, and that is looking at the age, the credits, and also defining what is the, the age that is not making them uh, make any progress and this is just to prevent students from dropping out and making sure they're going to uh, graduate with a high school diploma within four to five years. Once again, we are doing, doing a deep analysis of all the existing systems and looking at policies, looking at the way that we re-engage students, 
and at the same time how we re-engage with parents, teachers, and partners, and school administrators. Now I will ask one of our fabulous, amazing principals, uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm moving ahead of time. No, 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 thank you. He, uh, no, no, yet, sorry. Uh, we are going to have a special presentation by uh, the principal of the high school, Mr. Christopher Mastrangelo, in a few minutes, but no now, no yet, thank you. I just wanna say that every month you are going to hear from one or two of the principals. Uh, we do have a request to please uh, make sure that you sign up for the COVID testing. Uh, we send all the information Saturday and Sunday. We need students to be, uh, in, in, uh, need to have a consent form because we cannot do any of the testing if you ha don't fill out the consent for form. Please, uh, let me, I know it's there, but you can see it too. Uh, please just email us, uh, go into the website, or use the uh, code bar just to make sure that we are going to be able to have students being tested. That is a way to prevent the, from the virus to uh, be spreading in our schools. The same thing with vaccination. Uh, I know it doesn't apply to all our students, but if you had the chance to vaccinate your child, we are doing it in schools. Uh, you just have to uh, sign up for that, and there are going to be different times and dates. You can get the information from your nurses, and we are going to send the new calendar in a few, um, few minutes um, after this meeting. Now we are going to hear from student services. Uh, Pamela, I'm sorry. Pam McDonald, I'm changing your name now, Pam. <laughs> to talk about um, updates so we have been working partnering with McLean's hospitals um, outreach program that works with schools on best practices around trauma um, informed teaching and we are happy to continue that work with them at our alternative program at the high school as well as we've expanded this consultation to include all of our school adjustment counselors K to 12 so we're super excited about that um, we are finishing up on our formal um, tiered focus monitoring and we um, held some PD for some of our staff and we have turned in our first progress report. So that's exciting. Um, we, this is um, exciting. So Pearson is starting to transition away from the hard copies of assessments and we are going to get on um, their, what's called their DALS library, which is the digital assessment library. Our school psychologists have already been working on this platform and um, this, Pearson is really pushing school systems to go to this. They're offering financial incentives as well as there are new testing kits coming out. So this seems like a, a good time to do that. So we're gonna talk with teachers um, on the half day, the special ed teachers and related service providers and move ahead with that, which is super exciting because it will give us a larger array of evaluations for our special ed students. Um, we are bringing back dedicated 504 coordinators um, to make sure that the 504s are done in a consistent uh, manner throughout the system. So we are doing interviews as we speak. Um, our IDA grants have been submitted with, a, with funds set aside to continue uh, aggressive regression in special ed students as, um, due to COVID, as well as funding to update upset, um, the assessment systems and other mental health and crisis needs. Um, as far as next steps, we are gonna do a train the trainer model. So any of the teachers of Malden Public School special ed teachers who are listening, this is a preview because I'm gonna ask you on um, Friday when we speak that uh, if anyone wants to be a trainer, let me know because um, we're gonna do a trainer trainer model for that. And McLean's has also partnered with us to offer partnering parent trainings, one for like K to five and one for six through eight and a high school one as well. So we will be working with CPAC to schedule those trainings. And that's all I have. Thank and you and I'm going to, uh, any, no questions. I'm going to uh, uh, ask uh, Patty to please come and present. Why don't we hold no questions. questions to the end, okay everybody? Hi everyone. Um, We began um, our testing this past Wednesday, um, first test and stay, that's our first student. They did the first test and stay option. Okay. Um, this is the current active cases on this slide. I did update this to um, 
today. Well, it's supposed to be updated to today, but this was the cases as of last Wednesday. Um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it's um, three more in addition to that. Um, and what that is, is these people are at home con um, completing their isolation of 10 days. So um, I'm all mixed up. The, um, I think that's it for that. That we're gonna do weekly. Okay, so here's the thing. I thought we were gonna go to the other one I first. can also okay. tell you that we are going to uh, okay. have a dashboard very soon before the end of the week where in our website, you are going to be able to see daily uh, posted the active co uh, COVID cases. Yeah, okay. So you can just go there, look at the website, and be able to tap into that. Okay. okay. Um, this here is an explanation of the testing that we, oh, you went to it. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> All right. Now the test and stay option happened um, this past Wednesday for unvaccinated, close contacts identified in school by the school nurses. That's what the test and stay option is. So far the program is going well and we're doing the testing for the district at the Salem Wood School at this time um, until we have more help arrive. And then we're going to have the testing option available in each school as that happens. Due to low enrollment, we're encouraging families to continue registering their students for in-school testing. The consent link um, has been shared with families with letters and it's also available on our website. In-school vaccination clinics um, will continue. Tomorrow is the last day for first vaccinations at the Linden School. Um, and this is a Pfizer vaccine. This is for um, all eligible students um, over the age of 12. These clinics will continue to take place every three weeks, so students who have, may have missed the first vaccination clinic will be able to sign up and register for the first vaccine at the next clinic. Um, and CHA is sponsoring this in-school vaccination clinic, and this will just continue on. This um, link to this sign-up is also on the website, and consent forms are in the school nurse's office if families um, can't use the link. New information, the COVID-19 um, dashboard will have current um, COVID cases on the Malden Public website and that's gonna go live this week. We will update this website every Friday. Um, we currently have approximately 1,000 students and 325 staff signed up across the district for our in-school testing. We're hoping that this registration will continue to grow. Again, the consent can be found on, found on the website under the um, MPS COVID testing program. Online registration is encouraged. Um, and again, those consents are in the school nurse's office. The next step, um, we will begin the third testing option, um, which is the COVID safety text, or also um, known as pool testing for students and staff. Schools will be test weekly beginning tomorrow at the Salem Wood School, and then we're gonna to move to the other students on Thursday and Friday and next Tuesday if, if needed. Eventually, when we get more staff on board, we'll be able to test the same day, hopefully, across the district. But for now, we're gonna use the staff that we have and test um, each day until they're completed. Um, Schedule of the next vaccination clinics will be posted on the website. This is for students, who, again, who want to begin the series, and it will also be for the second vaccines. We continue to encourage all eligible students to sign up for this and take advantage of the in-school vaccinations. Now, this slide here explains all the testing options. There seems to be a little bit of confusion over that. Um, this one consent form that families sign up for makes them eligible for all three of these testing. One consent does all. The first testing is symptomatic testing. It's available in the school nurse's office. This is for symptomatic students that happen during the school day. We ask the families not send their students to school with symptoms, um, but this option is available if this, they're symptomatic during the school day. The school nurses will do this, and this is done by the 15-minute antigen testing of Binax now. Students are then, if they're negative and feeling well enough, will be able to go back to their class. Um, the second option is the test and stay option. This is the option for students who are identified as close contacts that are unvaccinated to allow them to stay in school. They test negative and they can go back to class. 
This is done each morning for seven days. Um, on the weekend, they'll have a kit eventually that they'll be able to take home and do at home on the weekends, and that's done on the computer with someone that will watch them do it. Um, for now, we ask that students stay quarantined on the weekend at home until we get those tests on board. This is done for seven days, and this will be seven days from the time that they're um, identified as a close contact. The third and final part of this testing is the pool testing or the COVID safety checks. This is done with a double swab, and this again is done by the trained staff from um, the CIC. Double swab is when um, they'll collect two swabs at the time of collection. One will go into this pool, and the other one they'll have individual for the students. If this pool tests positive, the lab will be able to test right away so that we'll have our positive, close, uh, or positive case as soon as we can to begin our testing. Um, and I think that's it. Thank, Thank you. you, and we encourage, encourage all parents and caregivers to please fill out the consent form uh, for this uh, test. It is so hard to do it when uh, actually we had to react and we don't have a consent on file. And please just do it. Uh, it really support our students. And if your child or your student it doesn't feel well, keep them at home. We will excuse that absence, but please do not send students uh, when they're sick to schools. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to invite Tony Mertz from the Finance and Operations. Good evening, everyone. Sorry, can you hear me? So good evening, everyone. Um, so any updates? We're going to have continuous cleaning, continues to happen throughout our schools. Our custodians have been amazing at cleaning and deep cleaning and deep cleaning <laughs> in rooms, <laughs> upon rooms, <laughs> but it's all good. They, they've been great. Um, so we will continue to do our deep cleaning on Fridays and clean buildings as needed throughout the day in all the heavy traveled areas. After school programs, we're still in need of staff. Therefore, we can't open the after school program to higher enrollment because we don't have enough staff to cover the after school program. And on entitlement grants and all other grants, we have submitted nine grants over the last two weeks. So we've been busy. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. And now uh, we are going to, I'm going to ask uh, Chris Mastrangelo, the principal of the Molding High School, to come and present. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having. <coughs> excuse me. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, I wanted to present on a few fronts, not the least of which, on our first uh, graphic here, is uh, something that I have uh, has been very important to me and a goal of mine since I've taken over as the high school principal. I, I took over mid-year, uh, January of 2018, an interim basis, and then 18-19, I took over as the full-time principal. But as I have on the slide, is a uh, total number of staff. And also, uh, alongside of it, uh, staff members that would categorize as traditionally marginalized subgroups. And as you can see, the trajectory uh, towards my goal of diversifying our faculty is, is I'm very pleased in the direction that we're going. I'm also fully aware that we, we haven't gone far enough. And I want to continue to grow uh, not only uh, great educators and the best educators we can for our students, because our students deserve it, uh, but I also want uh, the faculty of my school to reflect the students in my school. Uh, and we're working hard towards that, and I'm very proud um, in my time here that we've gone from 6.8% the year before I got in uh, to 21.4% and 12 to 42. Uh, and we're gonna continue to focus on ways that we recruit teachers. Uh, and again, the end, the end game is to get the best possible teachers for the best possible teaching and learning for our students that reflect the students that are sitting in the seats. So in the second slide, uh, just to piggyback on that just a little bit, I will have to tell you that my uh, the 2021-2022 um, data is actually inaccurate. I redid my numbers and I can tell you that it's actually higher than is posted in the screen, so I apologize for getting that in after we published. We're actually uh, 40 teachers at 20.4% that speak, um, many speak multiple languages, uh, and uh, that also falls in line with the hiring practices around students, uh, faculty members that speak similar languages to the major languages that we're seeing at the high school. So uh, I apologize for the, for the uh, mess up in my, in my data. <clears throat> I 
think we're ready for slide three. So I just kind of highlighted some of our accomplishments so, so far this year. Um, and if you go across the student treatment committee's uh, advisory, uh, we're creating uh, two advisory groups this year. One is a faculty advisory group and another is a student advisory group and we're bringing them together. Uh, and I want my students and my faculty at our school to be in a table in a room together and discussing, um, sharing thoughts and, and concerns or, or maybe some, some victories that our schools are having uh, in the same room through different lenses uh, and take away the student and teacher um, level and just groups of people that all love the school and want to do what's best in a room discussing ways that we can look at what we're currently doing, um, really uh, emphasize and grow on what we're doing well and maybe adjust and tweak some things that we think we need to do better and even bring some things in that we don't even know that maybe we as adults and as educators don't know that the students want. So I'm trying to provide that opportunity uh, for you know, really the, the stakeholders in the building. Um, I say it all the time, we're outnumbered. We're 753 to about 196. Uh, and you know, the, the fact that we're making all the policies really doesn't reflect the numbers in the school. And I really, another um, focus of mine has been really to foster an uh, agency and student voice within the building. I think this is an opportunity. The review board that you see is really looking at some of our um, practices within the building. Certainly, uh, I hate using the word discipline, but maybe some, some conduct uh, trends. And, and we're gonna look at some data with, again, with faculty and students alike. Uh, we're calling it a student faculty review board to really look at some of the trends we're seeing across subgroups, across grades, across uh, uh, levels of students to see where we're tracking and how we can then work backwards from that data and really look at our practices so we can work more towards preventative than reactive. Uh, and that I just put, again, I just put some of the um, forms out for students and, and faculty to sign up for these. We wanted to get the year going before we went towards. And then a student voice project. I know you all heard from our amazing students late spring of last year. Uh, and one of the things that we had said when we brought this group in is that it was not a one year thing. It was gonna be part of the fabric of the school. Uh, and Ms. Sibley and I met early this morning and planned out our next step around bringing our next group of students in. Uh, we have a couple potential faculty members that are going to oversee it, much like last year, and we're going to roll out the recruiting process for that probably next week. Moving down to programs, our RISE program, I believe that uh, Super Assistant Superintendent McDonald just spoke about that. It's a new therapeutic program at the high school uh, that we've staffed, and it's a brand new uh, for us. We're already seeing dividends from a smaller group opportunity where we can uh, have opportunity for increased social emotional support for our students alongside academic support in a much smaller setting. So we're already seeing an early return on that. That's very positive. Our Bright program is uh, we've had now for years. It's something that we wanted to bring in years ago. Uh, we brought it in, I think, three years ago. We've shifted the focus. Uh, where our, the Bright coordinator now is a, is a certified a social worker. So we, we have, um, we previously had a academic focus for, to, for the person who's overseeing the program. She did a wonderful job. But we shifted the focus again, coming back from the pandemic. Uh, really trying to meet the students social emotional needs uh, and helping them uh, um, move back into the classroom coming out of hospitalizations maybe students that are dealing with some anxiety that's overwhelming them in the classroom is just too big for them we want to give them supports give them strategies and circle them back into the classroom so they can be successful and again we shifted that focus to our coordinator uh, certified social worker um, so a uh, special ed department just briefly uh, we have increased uh, um, team chairs, uh, we've lightened the load for Liz Smith, who's our program manager and is amazing, by the way. Um, and she, uh, through the help of uh, Super Assistant Superintendent McDonald, we're able to see that we need the need and we shifted uh, one team chair up from the middle school pre-COVID and we're able to fund another position. So we're excited to really meet the needs of our students that need special ed, ser special ed services. Um, where are we at now? Our staffing is increasing. You can see in my first slide that we're uh, 20 some odd staff members um, more than we were just a few years ago. Uh, so that's, that's exciting. Uh, and an interesting note that this, in the last two years, six of our new faculty members at Malden High School are Malden High School grads from the time that I've been working at Malden High School. So we're, and we're running that Grow Your Own program, but we're already starting. We're trying to bring our students back uh, that walk the halls. Uh, again, another lens for we as adults in the building for some of our newer teachers that were walking the halls you know, very recently uh, and we're excited and they're acting as role models for our Grow Your Own students as well. 
Um, and we also last year were at five social workers in the building. Uh, this year we're up to nine. Again, that was a focus coming back from the pandemic, trying to create social emotional support. So we're hoping to get more as the year goes on. Around curriculum, we're excited about our new American Sign Language curriculum. We moved away from Latin uh, and we shifted to our ASL. We have an amazing teacher, uh, Ms. Iadonis. Uh, the, the, the classes were full. Uh, and I walked by the cafeteria the other day and saw two students speaking in sign and they laughed. And I, I leaned in and said, what are you doing? I said, oh, we, we said we were going to have a, a, a sign lunch today. They were going to try to sign rather than speak. And they were both students in this I know this class. So uh, we're hoping to grow that program as well. Uh, we've moved towards more culturally appropriate texts within our ELA department, um, looking at taking a hard look at our curriculum and our offerings and where we can improve. Uh, so through the help of our Shahir Marquez, our teacher leader, my staff, and of course, Mr. Hurley, our, our director of Humanities, uh, we took a hard look and we started shifting around some of the text to more reflect the students that we meet, not just the subject of the text, but also authors. Uh, we're taking a hard look, and it is a hard look at what we're offering and how we're doing it, right? And then we're also looking at integration of levels where we're having maybe some CP and honors students in the same classrooms. Uh, and then the teacher is really differentiating the, the, the instruction to meet both needs within the same classroom. And we're getting kids out of their silos and, and, and getting them together, integrating them level wise. And then I really want, excuse me, want to highlight some of our AP exams. And I think these are amazing because we're on the back end of a pandemic. Uh, and what it really did is I highlighted every uh, exam where we were above, and as you can see, in some cases, well above the state average. Uh, and I will kind of hone in on our Calc BC, which is 100% of our students got a qualifying score. As you know, a qualifying score is a three, four, or five, um, which means they, in fact, can move on and receive the college credit. And also our seminar. Uh, I think it's, my, my old eyes can't see, but I think it's 96%. Uh, and you can see that we're well over the state average and also in our research as well. And I think on any year, those numbers are impressive. But I think on the back end of a pandemic year, they're particularly impressive. Which brings us to slide four, I believe. And just some of the highlights. Uh, as you know, we have a new schedule at the high school. We're four by four block scheduling. So far, it is a big hit. Um, the faculty, the feedback I'm getting is really strong, ability to kind of slow down, dig deep into the teaching, uh, which improves opportunity for learning. The students, you know, a little fatigued at first, I had some lunch conversations and explained to them that, you know, you, you can't run a marathon without training, so they're going to build that stamina up as they go on. And I'm starting to hear less and less complaints. It's starting to be what they expect every day. Um, of course, our flex block. Uh, which is, again, huge hit. We just started our second cycle today, and we broke that into two blocks. One is we're looking at um, enrichment or really some so, uh, another opportunity for social-emotional support and academic support with our enrichment block. And then, of course, our joy block, where we literally put joy into the school schedule, where we're offering all sorts of different opportunities for students to connect with teachers at a level that they did not know they connected. Uh, it rotates every three weeks. So far, it's been fantastic to see. Uh, a vision of a graduate work started pre-COVID. Uh, we're now taking the next steps. We're aligning our rubrics within all our content areas. Uh, and we're trying to create a vision of a Malden High School graduate. And the pillars that we lean upon that we brought together with our teachers, with our educators, and our students, uh, in other words, the things that we really want to build our foundation for when our students leave the school, they're around communicators, collaborators, critical thinkers, innovative learners, empowered citizens, and persistent individuals. And we actually have Mr. Luongo, our computer graphics teacher, creating a graphic for that. The students are designing, and then our students and staff and faculty and caregivers will vote on which graphic we push out there as what we see as our visual for our vision of a graduate. Just increase around our foreign language department, we're making great strides again on the support of our director, Diane Brooks. I just spoke about ASL. We doubled our Italian teachers. We had one, now we have two. Uh, because the numbers uh, warranted that. And we actually brought in uh, another Spanish teacher because our numbers warranted as well. We're continuing to grow. I want to continue to grow that to move towards mass board, to move towards a way more electives for our students. And obviously, with, the pop with how popular our ASL classes are, we're going to need, <laughs> I'm anticipating we'll need another teacher next year so we can pick up our level two students and continue to grow it. And we knew that when we started this this year, which is Miss Iadonis. Uh, the RISE program I just spoke about, our early college center, that is, man, um, that is uh, 
really has Ms. Fornash in there at all points. Uh, Ms. Craven's done amazing work with that. It's an opportunity for all our students that are participating in early college. It's a drop-in center that any questions that they have, it's on the fourth floor of the Boyle House. And also an opportunity for students that want to come in and maybe use that space as a study area and do some work. It's set up as a very welcoming space. I welcome, I invite any of you to come in. Um, and just some stuff that's going on this week. Our progress reports are available on Aspen Effective today. So family and caregivers can log on and see the progress reports. Get ahead day that Ms. Craven's gonna speak more deeply about in a minute. It's coming up on the 13th. Um, first quarter grades are closing at the end of the month and the report cards will be distributed to the students uh, a week thereafter, so their first week in November. Really our next steps are just continue assessing, looking at our curriculum, looking at our teaching and learning. And we always drive that, I look through that through a lens of equity which drives us. All of our students deserve the best possible teaching and learning. Um, we're gonna work to is increase our staffing for our electives. I want more art teachers, I want more phys ed teachers, I want more health teachers, I want it all because our kids deserve it all. We're trying to get these kids into classes uh, every period and really trying to pique some interest at all levels. Uh, who knows, we have another, the budding stockbrokers, but they need the opportunity to have that class in school. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, again, we're gonna continue to foster student voice. Uh, which you heard tonight, and we're gonna continue to foster that. I do wanna rotate back. I jumped over the Youth Truth, the Youth Truth survey we did last fall. We partnered with them. They gave us amazing data uh, that we've actually folded into the, our action steps for this year, for instance. Uh, and, and again, the student voice group, the student voice project really broke down that data. And some of the action, po the action points they put out there were uh, quarterly community uh, events for our ninth graders. We're having our first one on the 13th with our ninth grade knowledge bowl. It's a, it's a real team builder. Um, re fostering community and building in the classrooms at the beginning of the year. Ninth grade boot camp we had for, our, for all of our ninth graders during the flex block to really kind of go over what it's like to be a student at Malden High School. Uh, and really they wanna, we also backed off on the content stuff in the first couple weeks to build some community within the classroom as well. And these are all really strategically and, um, intentional uh, strategies based out of the work that our students in the Student Voice Project did last year. Those are the action steps, and we folded it into our, what we're doing this year. Uh, the new schedule is also an offshoot of that, and we, we, within the enrichment block, we have more opportunity for our students to meet with our post-secondary counselors, which was an action step that came out of their work. And we have job fairs coming back and college nights coming up in November, I think, Ms. Craven. So all that came from the work that our students did last year and the student representative the school committee we put it out to the entire school I can tell you that we've had 25 students show interest they were told uh, asked to submit a written piece of why and now we're coming together with our committee um, to go through the written the narrative that they put through uh, and then they're gonna go through an interview process as well uh, we don't target one group we send it out to the entire school everybody has an opportunity to apply and I'm, Happy to say we had a good turnout this year with 25. So you will have somebody in place for the November meeting. I was trying to get somebody in for tonight, but I didn't want to rush the process. So you'll have somebody in place for the November meeting. And that, I believe, is it. So thank you. Thank you so much. And we are going to hear now from a school counseling, testing, and academic support, Erin Craven. Good evening. Um, things that have gone on in the world of school counseling in the past 30 days since we last presented. Um, kept it all onto one slide. Fun updates, our seniors had a post-secondary planning seminar um, just this week, so all seniors met with their school counselor for 85 minutes to just begin the discussions of the logistics of their particular post-secondary process. Um, college, uh, job, trade, gap years, all the different things. Um, and then coming up, as Mr. Strando said, get ahead is um, short for get a Higher Education Access and Development Day. Um, and so that will be next Wednesday. Um, the 10th and 11th graders, we've been providing the PSAT to them free of charge for a number of years. Um, with the conjunction of the city of Malden noticing in the pandemic that SAT was not available to many of our students, we're gonna make the SAT available to them as well on that day, free of charge. Um, and then the ninth graders will be involved um, in a full day knowledge bowl um, that is more social emotional learning, getting to reorient with MHS, um, get to know your peers, really get to feel as though you're part of that community through a variety of activities. So more on that next month after we, after we have it. 
Um, also FAFSA, which the financial aid forms for college opened on October 1st. So um, we have a partnership with U Aspire and we are immediately beginning work with um, a U Aspire counselor and our college and career center to make sure students have support to fill in the FAFSA. Um, as you know, a lot of our first generation students, the FAFSA is a very new piece of information for them and filling out those financial aid forms um, are key to success in college. So um, those are things, sort of updates that are new. Um, little turn on that, the reduction of the dropout rate, it was something um, we had discussed the 1920 dropouts and I think last month. And from that, under the direction of Dr. Norega, we have found at the high school, five students are actually withdrawn as opposed to dropped out. Um, and two have re-enrolled. So every little bit counts, every student, um, and every other student on the list has been contacted by the MHS administration and counselors as to their whereabouts, um, and we have detailed records on that as well, but those are the ones that we know um, from a year ago. That's the public data that's available. Um, new information, I realize we began a couple years ago what they call MyCap Google Classrooms, so career and academic planning, MyCap is the state's term for post-secondary processing and planning, K through 12. Um, so our 9th through 12th graders all have a designated MyCap Google Classroom, previously known as the Guidance Google Classroom, because it alliterates so well. Um, so there is information for all students at all grades, um, and as you can see in our next steps, we're working on integrating that into the 7th and 8th grade. Um, with the 5th through 8th grade counselors, we're working on College Career Life Readiness Curriculum, known as CCLR, and they're having a training later this week on Naviant software for them to again bring the 7th and 8th graders into that post-secondary um, and thinking about life after high school in those grades. Um, we also have one K through four counselor at the BB who does amazing stuff under Dr. Murphy. She is working on integrating SEL lessons um, for any interested classroom teachers at the BB K through four. And as she works through some of um, her process during the year, we hope to duplicate her in other schools um, gathering data from her work, but that is something unique and, and great happening, happening there. Um, other next steps, just working, we have an amazing college and career center staffed by two people from College Advising Core BU, CACBU. Um, so they're full time in the college and career center along with our counseling staff who meet with all students. So we want to make sure everyone has equitable access to all post-secondary activities and planning. Um, and then dealing with current prevention of dropouts, we have a list of students um, that we're working on both at the eighth grade level um, from our October 1 Sims report and in the ninth and twelfth grade levels and in between as well to work on students who are overaged and undercredited and targeting those students as a priority for this winter and working on acceleration with them academically um, at the high school level and at the K grades, but particularly those credits at the high school. So, more to come on that in the next couple months. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are going to hear from the Diversity, Equity, and Engagement Assistant Superintendent, Dor Dorisa Dorothy. Good evening. Um, before I start with my report, I'd like to thank Ms. Jean for her courage as she implores us to continue to do better for our students uh, and not only listen, but hear, act, and respond as so many of the students who we've spoken to and the staff members in the district um, have told us. So I'm looking forward to, in a couple of slides, giving you a sneak peek into some of that professional development work that we're going to be doing in order to increase our culturally responsive pedagogy and the work that we as educators will do uh, moving forward. Um, and in the interest of doing better, I am happy to tell you that this slide has been updated significantly. Um, as of today, we have zero um, applications under review. So that means that the Welcome Center has processed all complete applications and is working on any other applications that might fall under the expedited um, designation where they might be missing a few things but we're going to really work with families to get them in as soon as possible. Um, we have registered since March 756, that was as of last Wednesday, but as you heard from Mr. Iovino, we are now up to 920 applications that have been reviewed and students who have been registered since March. So when I spoke to you last month, um, we did just look at that snapshot of time from the 30th to the 8th, which was 169, but that doesn't really tell the whole story of what the Welcome Center has been working on since last March. So I wanted to give you a larger um, view into those numbers. 
because in a typical year, we would enroll about 1,200 students, and we are almost to that number, very close, and we do expect to exceed that number as we move forward into this school year, and then when we also see that we usually see a little bit of a wave uh, in the winter months. Um, so last time I was here, I was asked to give an update on the timeline for the online Aspen registration. I'm happy to report that Aspen has all of our information. Um, they are in the configuration stage, so we are cautiously optimistic that we are ahead of schedule. Um, we have the benefit of not being the first Aspen district to be able to do this process. So that process and configuration is already embedded. I'll be meeting with them later this week to talk about what that might look like and then hopefully move into our training maybe by the end of this month um, with still the goal of December 1st for our online registration for 2021-2022 registrations, which will give us an opportunity during that slower period of time where we don't have as many applications for us to learn the system, to get used to how we support families, to build additional resources before we do pre-enrollment for the 2022-2023 school year. So the fundamental change to the Welcome Center will be that when families come, we will be supporting them in scanning and uploading documentation. The benefit is also that Aspen translates into not only all of our seven major languages, but almost all of the 60 plus that we have in the district. So our, um, our work will then be move from just being a clearinghouse of documentation to also being able to simultaneously have medical review and any other review of documentation for our English language learners or our special education students simultaneously with the benefit of families being able to log in and see at any point in time where their application is. And finally, um, some bright spots and updates. So the Welcome Center enrolled just during the week of um, September 20th. The Welcome Center enrolled 145 new students. And an amazing work by um, Ms. McCabe and her team with the ELL uh, language assessments. Almost, this is actually needs to be updated to over 300 students have been assessed under the WIDA assessment for language in that department. It's an amazing push from, from everybody, but specifically for all of the teachers and I wanna thank everyone who came out and volunteered their time to test our students so that they could get into school at the appropriate linguistic level. Um, as I mentioned, our configuration is to be live for December 1st, and what I'm really excited about is that on Friday last week, uh, all of our copies of Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain made it into our schools. So now we can really start working on the PLC work that will be coming uh, within the next week or two to all of our educators. It will be somewhat optional this year. However, many of the directors and uh, Ms. Pena with her work will be infusing the work of culturally responsive teaching in the brain into our professional development with a much deeper level as we move forward. We are also, I spoke to um, a student from the high school uh, last week and we also discussed potentially doing a culturally responsive teaching in the brain or culturally responsive mm -hmm. learning group at the high school and we're thinking about how we can expand that K-12 so that students also get the benefit of some of this brain-based research. Um, what we're going to be working on next is the policy review process that uh, uh, school committee member Welday will be presenting in a moment. Um, also working with Ms. Luong and the bullying uh, task force to think about how our online anonymous reporting system can be revamped, looking at the Sandy Hook Promise. We are also um, thankful to be engaging in the Desi Family School Partnership Initiative. We're starting that this week, so big thank, to Ms. thank you to Director Craven for writing that for us, with us. <laughs> um, to be able to get in there. We were actually able to get into the fall cohort. We thought we'd only be able to get into the spring, but super excited to be doing that work with the family liaisons. Um, and I wanted to just give you a quick update since one of my hats is supporting human resources on where we are with action steps and uh, goals for our educators. As you know, DESE regulations say that October 1st is the time, as does the collective bargaining agreement, that October 1st is the deadline for educators to share their goals and action steps and their self-assessment. So out of our 590 educators that are eligible under this, 510 have shared or signed their self-assessment and 538 have shared and, or signed their 
goals and action steps. So that's a significant number. It's a, I'm really proud of our educators. And um, this being the first year where it's, we're back to some sort of regular schedule from COVID, really amazing work by our educators um, and our school leaders. So our next up is really working deeply on how we are uh, strategic about policy and procedure review. Going to be working with the policy and procedure subcommittee on um, thinking about how we are intentional about doing that work. Um, and we're going to be working with some community meetings with uh, Dr. Noriega Murphy to continue to gain more information as we, sh we shape our equity work. Um, and we're still waiting for our response from DESE about the teacher diversification grant that I mentioned, I believe, last month. Um, but we are in the teacher diversification PLC. So uh, things are looking good in that space. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Now we're going to hear from our Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment, Emily Peña. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, school committee members, Dr. Noriega. Murphy and Mayor Christensen. I know you guys have been listening for a long time, so I have eight bullets, and then I have a couple of uh, visual slides that I will walk you through. Um, so I wanted to just, as an update, mention that the MCAS data review and analysis to identify our strengths and areas of growth by grade and by content has been completed, and that is, um, shared with the superintendent um, in a report. We have also completed the ESSER three grant with feedback from all stakeholders. Um, we had mentioned that we wanted to partner with educational staffing solutions to increase the number of substitute teachers that are available to cover for staff absences. So that partnership is now in place and we are working to get everything in order to start benefiting from their services. Um, with the help of Christy Magris, we have completed um, a review and an approval of all the homeschool requests and send notification to families. In terms of new information, um, our department is in the beginning stages of planning instructional rounds in all of our schools. So instructional rounds in terms of the book written by Fireman, Tittle, and Elmore. Um, that's what we are defining because I know that there's been different types of um, walkthroughs and instructional rounds done in Malden Public Schools, but we really want the focus of the instructional rounds as described by um, the textbook. Um, we are also interviewing uh, starting tomorrow for a new K-5 to uh, STEM director, and we are continuing interviews for the Director of Instructional Technology. In terms of next steps, um, our next grant that is due is our McKinney-Vento grant, and that is due November 1st. Um, and then we are also exploring a partnership with Varsity Tutors to offer tutoring services to any student who needs it. The next slide is gonna just give you um, a couple of snapshots of our 2021 MCAS data. So on this slide, it does say 2021 accountability classification, but because of how COVID uh, impacted MCAS, this is really still our determination from 2019. But as you could see, schools can fall into two categories. One category being requiring assistance from the state and so those would be the two categories to the far right, and then the remaining five categories to the left are um, not requiring assistance from the state. So in the blue, you see that that's where Malden as a district falls, which is substantial progress toward targets. In the next slide, which is our um, achievement, MCAS achievement for ELA. The first box is categorizing what um, our ELA scores were district-wide for grades three to eight. And then the second box is ELA scores for 10th grade. So um, the color orange is our district scores. Blue is for um, 
the state. And so you will see that for grades three to eight, our scaled scores were 493, so we were a little shy of meeting expectations for grades three to eight in ELA. But you'll also notice a pattern throughout all of the data that we're not far behind from what the um, state is doing in blue. So it just goes to show that we're kind of in line with how a lot of other districts were faring on MCAS this past year. So in grade 10, we were just right over at 501 meeting expectations and the state was at 507 with a scaled score 507. The next slide is for math. And so for our math scores for grades three to eight, um, the district had a scaled score of 484. So we fell in the partially meeting expectations, um, not falling far behind the state at 490. And then for grade 10, we were at 498, so almost to meeting expectations, and the state was at 501. So now switching a little bit, we mentioned, um, uh, Tony mentioned that we have been submitting a lot of grants and she has been helping us with the ESSER three grant. So part of that grant required that we surveyed stakeholders so we um, partnered with the Donovan Group, created a survey that we disseminated um, about two weeks ago, and we had it out for about 10 days. So you'll see here that about 1,580 community members completed the survey, um, including 1,384 in English. And then it does the breakdown by all the different um, languages that it was completed in. So 41 in Spanish, 57 in Portuguese, five in Vietnamese, 29 in Cantonese, 43 in Mandarin, 15 in Arabic, and one in Amharic, five in Haitian Creole. So we were proud that we were able to get um, vast representation for our, from our different um, language groups in Malden. And then right below that, um, still in the same slide, uh, Mr. Weldai, it gives a breakdown of who participated. So. Caregivers and parents, 52% um, of those 1,580 were responses from caregivers and parents, and that was our highest response group, um, followed by extended family members, and then Malden Public School students, 21.27% responded. And then in terms of like teachers, support staff, school administrators, that percentage was around 29%. Um, with sprinkling in some community members, local elected officials, um, and some other members of the community. So then this next slide just represents um, 10 categories that we focused on that aligned with the areas that ESSER allows us to spend these funds. So those four core areas that ESSER allows us to spend the funds are, are enhanced core instruction, targeted student supports, talent development and staffing, and conditions for student success, so social, emotional, and mental health supports. The, this section of the survey, it was a brief survey, it was only like a five minute survey, we really were trying to get as many people to respond, had um, a, a score of from five to one, so most important, important, somewhat important, of low importance or not important at all. So what I captured here for your summary is the percentage that ranked that category as either most important or important for us to spend the funds in those areas. And so you will see here that the highest one um, in this category was focusing on mental health supports and social emotional. Um, another really high one was COVID mitigation prevention at 87%. And um, educator support and professional development, 80%. COVID learning loss, 81%. And then facility updates, 82%. You could see all the other percentages there, but just wanted to give you an idea how all the people surveyed responded to how they want us to spend the funds. 
And then on my last slide is just a quick update with numbers in terms of homeschool request. We really wanted to pay attention to how many families that had previously not um, requested homeschooling were now requesting it. Um, and so the number of families who have always homeschooled their students, that's 33 students and that remained the same. There are new residents to Malden that are not enrolled in our schools and those were 12. So all together about 45 students that that has always been the family's option is to homeschool. In terms of its students that were enrolled in Malden Public Schools and are now requesting um, homeschool, there was 12 students. So that actually concludes my slides, but I also want to take a minute to share a less planned but yet important update. Um, and that was, and this message is for Ms. Jean. I just want you to know that this department, the Department of Curriculum, Instruction and Assessment heard you, and we are saddened by your experience in Malden Public Schools, and we really commit to doing the work that ensures that zero students feel and have the experience you had of brokenness that you described. We thank you for reminding us that this is the work that culture, race, and belonging is really what we're here to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to um, hear from Jennifer McKay, Director of Title III. Good evening, everybody. How you doing? Um, I just want to share briefly that we have increased the English learner enrollment. Now we're up to over 1,000 students, 1,062. Um, as my colleagues shared, we've tested over 300 English learners in the past month. So we've been very busy. <laughs> you can see that Salemwood still has the highest amount of English language learners in the district, uh, 331. And then after that, we have um, the Ferryway School. So that's kind of new. Ferryway is really getting a lot of English language learners, which is a little bit different from years past. Um, Malden High School, then BB, then uh, Linden, and uh, Forestdale. Some new things that are happening, some updates. We have. Um, the Malden High School students, grades 9 and 10, we are recruiting some students for the Chinese Immigrant Leadership Program. This is an after-school program in Chinatown. We've worked with them in the past, so we're looking forward to really supplement some of the after-school program need for students in grades 9 to 10. Great news, we've hired a new EL assessment trilingual coordinator for the Welcome Center, Marie Ritchie. She's part of the Malden community. She has volunteered for Malden Neighbors Helping Neighbors Group, and we're really excited and grateful for her addition to our Malden family. Um, the district EL coaches and I will attend a three-day Imagine Learning training. Imagine Learning has a new component called Imagine Reading. It's designed to accelerate the ESL reading comprehension and academic discourse conversation to meet grade level standards. We heard from our parents of English learners that they really want us to focus more on comprehension of complex text. So this is our effort to do that. When we return for the training, we're going to roll out sort of a teacher, train the teacher model across the district and work with um, all staff that service English language learners. Uh, in the future, we're going to create some data team meetings at the high school based on some of the MCAS data. We'll look at the fall I ready literacy data and fall writing samples, and we'll start to mirror some of the K to eight data meeting trends up at the high school and work with our content area directors and leadership and principals. And last, our EL coaches and myself, we are rolling out the culturally responsive teaching trainings, but through the MTA to reach a wider audience so that we can um, differentiate for the entire state and and work with our colleagues across the state on this uh, district-wide initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Jen.
Now we're going to hear from Victoria Mulkern, Director of Literacy and Title I. Good evening. The first slide is just a table of the um, the different schools and the percentage of low-income students receiving free or reduced lunch. This is how we allocate Title I funding as we are um, assigned by the state. As you can see, Malden High School is now a Title I school because they surpassed the 75% mandatory amount that if, all school, if a school has greater than 75%, students um, qualifying for free or reduced lunch, the school is required to be serviced as a Title I school. So therefore, we are working jointly with Principal Mistrangelo, Director Aaron Craven, Director Greg Hurley, uh, Director Jen McCabe, and myself. We're all working slow to move fast to assess what students we should target, what systems and supports we currently have in the high school, and what intervention programs are out there so that we can really support the literacy of our older students and prevent that dropout rate that Superintendent Noriega has spoken about. Next slide, please. This past month, the Title I department um, enjoyed holding family engagement breakfast at each of the five K through eight schools. We had wonderful attendance and we're looking to continue that great success this month as we hold our first family nights. It's gonna be a family Zumba night at each of the five K through eights. Please join us, we would love to have you there. Our co literacy coaches at each of the K through eights conducted all the baseline testing and they've held data meetings and Tier two intervention services will be commencing either last week or this week. Additionally, we sent out a district-wide writing prompt to all teachers on September 28th in order to gain baseline data in students' writing, knowing that the writing of students might be lower than usual after 18 months of COVID. Again, the high school now qualifies as a Title I school, so we're gonna look at how we can allocate funds to achieve a higher um, literacy program there in the high school by probably hiring another coach for the high school as well as six part-time literacy assistants. Finally, we sent out a survey today to all community members to gather interest in joining a K-8 ELA literacy curriculum adoption committee as we're hoping to pilot a new curriculum K-8 starting next school year. And we encourage all of you interested to join as well as students so that we can incorporate a curriculum that is more culturally sustaining and relevant and meaningful for all Malden students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. We are going to hear from the Director of Athletics, Health and Wellness, Charlie Conoke. Am I last? I don't know. I think so. I don't know if going so last is best, good or bad. Is last. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Superintendent, and esteemed school committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on athletics and happenings in our wellness department district-wide. Uh, well, we're full-fledged into our fall season of athletics. Uh, so far, luckily, safe and productive. Uh, thank, thankfully to our coaches and, of course, our student athletes. Uh, special thanks goes out to our athletic trainer, Jen Sturdivant, the Malden High School nursing staff and director of nursing, Patty Tremendosi, ensuring our number one priority is health and safety and like I said, thus far, so far, so good. Uh, this four, this fall, uh, we have a full slate of athletics, seven varsity teams, five sub varsity teams, middle school teams in baseball, boys and girls cross country, and in inner city boys and girls basketball uh, league in conjunction with the Malden Recreation Department. Uh, as far as individual sports go, uh, Football enjoyed its first win uh, as the mayor and I sat in the end zone. Uh, <laughs> as time ticked away, we were able to hold on uh, to a 14 to 12 win. Uh, and that was Coach Axelholm's first win as uh, head varsity coach. So kudos to him. Uh, boys and girls soccer play in a competitive Greater Boston League. Uh, 
each have close to a 500 record and hope to compete in the state tournament later this month, early November. Boys and girls cross country, off to a decent start. Uh, one of my favorite times of the year is just about to start this Thursday. Unified Basketball will travel to Stoneham to play in their first uh, interscholastic basketball game. Next Thursday, if you are around 3.30, Finn Jim, we will be hosting our arch nemesis in Medford and Unified Basketball. 3.30, Finn Jim, if you're around, come and support our kiddos. They're really excited and we got Vegas gold t-shirts for them to wear, so it's pretty cool. Uh, we are ecstatic that we have middle school sports back. Uh, middle school baseball has enjoyed a winning streak and Miss Batterfors, little Gino, has been out there having some fun. So it's been great to see them play outside. Uh, special thanks to DPW and uh, Mr. Robert Knox. He, he did a fantastic job getting the field ready, especially after some, some recent rainstorms. Um, Boys and Girls Cross Country, led by Michael Nichol Nicholson. He's a physical educator at the BB. Uh, they have three more meets and a league meet left on the on this schedule and we are looking to later this month have a sports information night for middle school sports at the high school um, as well as inviting our freshmen and as you saw from the new incomers uh, we have lots of transfer students so uh, trying to get as much information out to the community as uh, as we can to make sure that everyone's aware of our offerings, especially as we head into the winter and, and spring seasons as we continue to add our middle school sports back into, into the mix. Uh, earlier this evening, uh, they're probably on their way back now, um, the, as I mentioned, the last school committee meeting in the conjunction with the TB12 Foundation, um, they are sponsored 12 of our student athletes. They were lucky to have their first session this evening. And if you check out our Twitter page, they were able to get some uh, TB12 approved smoothies on and they took care of us. So I'll keep you apprised of that throughout the year. They'll be, they'll be going once a month um, and we'll be sharing their, their um, progress throughout the year. Uh, as far as our health and wellness department goes, as uh, Superintendent Noriega mentioned this uh, October is National Bullying Prevention Month. All health classes will be offering or implementing uh, cyberbullying and bullying prevention lessons. Some of the lessons include media balance, online safety, how, to, how technology makes you feel, device-free moments, and putting a stop to online meanness and media choices. And that concludes. I think I was close to two minutes. That's great. <laughs> and uh, we want to make sure that you are going to buy the membership. I believe it's seventy-five dollars, and uh, just go and support the team. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Come on, it's seventy-five. We have to make money. Twenty-five dollars. <laughs> hey, and, and uh, yeah, that's that's a good image. I made that. So. Yay! <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So this concludes uh, our report for this. Any questions of our superintendent? No. <laughs> Lot to take in. Uh, let's go to Miss Luong. Thank you. I actually just had one question regarding the FAFSA um, workshops and counselors that are going to be available. I wasn't sure if you were also going to have parent workshops around that. And would they be held at night on Zoom or what was your plan? Yes, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, you. Not on my slide, um, but still, just because we haven't advertised to students yet, we'll have a family um, post-secondary planning night for all 12th graders, and then any interested 11th or 10th grade parents can come. Um, that should be, I believe, Ms. Restrangel and I were planning for October 27th, and we believe that'll be virtual, just given the current environment. Um, we do have um, FAFSA. We have a partnership with USPIRE, um, mm -hmm. which is, specializes just in completing the FAFSA. And as such, they um, have a person who they are still in the process of hiring. Typically, they're hired by now. Um, but someone for two days a week that meets with families, um, meets with individual students, specifically around that. Um, 
We also have in the late afternoons, um, because we, well, I applied for a grant, we got additional grant money for FAFSA, the counselors themselves will be available for late afternoon after school workshops on completing the FAFSA. And then families, we usually have one or two opportunities for all families welcome, but it seems to be such an individual process that we just allow families the opportunities to meet with an expert um, if they so desire. Did that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. LeWong. Uh, Mr. Welder. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of really quick notes, and, and you definitely don't need to, to hop up for it, but um, to Principal Mastrangelo, uh, thank you for your presentation. I saw, uh, I saw something a friend of mine had posted somewhere online the other day that was a great picture of uh, a student, and the, the caption said something like, central office is meeting with central office, and the principals are meeting with the principals, and the teachers are meeting with the teachers, but no one's meeting with us, and they're all meeting about us. And I think what you showed tonight is what we already knew about the way in which uh, you lead your building, which is that the kids are um, very much at the center of the decision-making process. And, and it was good to sort of, I, I'd, I'd forgotten about the, not forgotten, but that the student voice presentation was gonna be coming back to us again to talk more about what's going on this year and hearing about their next steps. And um, I think that was really clear in everything that you said and, and the way in which you lead is that the kids really are at the center uh, of the decision-making process, and that is very cool, and I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, the only two uh, questions that I have, and I think they're more just asks for the next meeting, because I'd just be curious to hear more about it, um, one of which um, is around our EL enrollment, and it's great to sort of see, uh, particularly around the, the, the chart that was uh, shown with current uh, enrollment, um, you get a better picture now that all the students are actually enrolled of like where they are and where they're going. And um, it is interesting to me that BB actually took the most uh, ELs enrolled in our incoming kindergarten class. And what I would be curious to see uh, sometime soon is what the staffing level changes have looked like over the past year or two or three, particularly within the EL department. Um, and I want to be clear, I'm, I'm asking more so to see how we can support the work that's being done and whether or not now that we're actually, it's very clear, right, that we're moving and we're, we're making sure that our L students are able to go to where, where they're closest to, not just where the programs are. Um, and I wanna make sure that we're providing you with the adequate resources uh, and staffing that you need to do that. And it's never too early to start planning because it's always budget season. So um, that would be really interesting, I think, for, for maybe the next meeting if possible. Um, and the only other uh, question, again, I think for the next time if we can, uh, if the data is ready by then, I would be curious to hear more about the district-wide district writing prompt, um, mm -hmm. particularly where, do we, we use iReady for both ELA and math? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. no it's just ready. math, or just no. ELA. So, ELA. Okay, so I know ready. that the ELA iReady does not measure writing, so I, I would be curious to hear more about like how the actual writing prompt mm -hmm. went, and I know, you know, the, you know the efficacy of it, was there calibration done between the staff members in terms of how they're looking at this? Um, and I think that would be kind of fun to, to see, okay. see how that went because yeah. it's a cool idea. Um, and I'd love to hear more about it. But <laughs> yeah. It's actually a strategic uh, plan to measure the baseline of writing for students and also the way that they think and how they reflect what they read to put it on words. So go ahead. Yeah. So teachers will be um, expected to administer it from 10-4 mm -hmm. to 10-15 and then from 10 18 to 1029, they'll be meeting in CPTs and grade level teams to calibrate the work across mm -hmm. the grade level. And then they'll be actually inputting the grades that on a common district-wide rubric, they'll be inputting the scores, not the grades, the scores in Aspen for them to see across the grade, for us to see as a district to get district-wide data. So by the next meeting, we should have that data for you. That's awesome, mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Waldai. Anybody else, if not? <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, too, have a few questions, but I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Connerfrey, for that shout out to my son. Um, he absolutely loves middle school sports, and I'm really happy to hear about um, introducing them to the high school sports. I think this is a time 
um, in especially the eighth graders' lives where they start looking at um, their future. Do we want to stay um, at Malden High? Do I want to potentially go to the Vogue? And I think sports is um, integral to you know some of um, the, the younger kids when it comes to that decision making. So, um, and also a plug to the Tornado Club, that $25 membership, but also they have really great gear. I know I just handed over a ton of money um, for some sweatshirts and t-shirts, so um, it, it's, it, it definitely benefits our students. So um, kudos to the uh, athletic department. Um, in regards to questions, um, the COVID cases that were reported um, by Ms. Tremendozi indicated 14 as of 929. And I'm just curious because what we're reporting out to Desi was different than your figure. Um, so, and on top of that, are we tracking, um, I, I see it on the Desi website, uh, teacher cases, but I didn't see that in your presentation. So will that information all be available on the dashboard that will go live? We, correct me if I'm wrong, Patty, we report to DESI once a week, mm -hmm. and that can vary day to day. So if we report on Wednesday, but her numbers on, give you her numbers on Thursday, some of the kids on Wednesday, or the teacher may, may, may have come out of isolation, and they would no longer be considered an active case by us on Thursday. So the problem with, when you look at DESI, is it's one day on Wednesday, but on Tuesday and Thursday, it could be totally different. Does okay. that make sense? No, it makes complete sense. I just want to make, if anybody is monitoring DESI, I do, and look at the figures on a weekly basis, that when this dashboard comes out, people are aware that there could be a discrepancy in the numbers. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, in regards to the schools, I know we're in the midst of putting in the um, water filtration systems. Ms. Mertz, I'm very happy to see um, BB is being worked on right now but I have been hearing um, complaints about lack of water for students. And I know last time we met, we were getting 50 cases per school. Well, was some have increased it to 80 cases per school. Is until that per water... month or no, per, no, week? per week? Per week. Per week, per week. okay. Per week. Yeah, it's per week until the water filtration system can get installed. Yep. Um, but just like everything else, the distributors just don't have the supply, right? So okay. we have to wait for the supply to come in so that then we can hire somebody or a plumber to come and put it in. So mm -hmm. our next project is BB, so they'll get one in the cafeteria and in the gym, at least two, and then so that we can start other schools with at least two water filtration or water bottle filling stations. Yeah. Yes. What's the ETA on having all schools completed? Don't know. So again, it depends on the distributor. It's not up to us. So whenever we can get it, like everything else, it's, everything is slow, mm -hmm. much slower these days than we were used to. So we just all have to be patient as we wait for this to happen. Understandable. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, and then lastly, in regards to the um, enrollment increase, um, Dr. Noriega, I noticed that um, particularly Ferryway had an in a huge increase of 83 students. Um, and in speaking with our public um, facilities director, we've started or, at the beginning of the year, maybe even in the summer, started turning some of like our computer class, computer rooms into classrooms. Is that because of the anticipated increase in, in students coming into the school? No, that was a decision that they made before uh, my arrival, that the classrooms were going to be into classrooms and not uh, computer rooms. So uh -huh. it's not because of enrollment, it was because of a decision that was made prior to, to that. Okay, thank you. And one thing that we are working on is in student projections. So we can actually put a, a cap in classroom sizes. Mm -hmm. So that is a project that we're going to be glad to present probably in November or the end of November is the student projections okay. according to sp space metrics. And then just lastly, in the last month's meeting, I did ask for a capacity per school. I don't know if you can provide that. Like, what is the maximum students each school could possibly hold. Yeah, that, that would be part of the projection number with the mm -hmm. um, capacity according to um, either special education classes or uh, regular ed. So we are looking actually on how to do the formula on what a class size for special ed inclusion should look like 
what a class size for regular inclusion mm -hmm. and what class for SEI and regular ed. So that would be something I would like to present to you in November when we are looking more about the projections. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Petafora. Seeing no other lights, we'll now move on to motions and resolutions. Mr. Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to make this quick and easy and say I'd like to make a motion to refer this to policy. Second. Second by Mr. Avino. Any questions on that for the residency? So the residency policy will be referred to policy. Any questions? Madam Clerk, so again, Mr. Weldon made the motion. It was seconded by Mr. Avino. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? The ayes have it, that carries unanimously. Uh, let's see, executive session. Uh, I can outline the matters before us one more time. So this is to approve the minutes of September 13th. And then it's also to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with units A, B, and C, as well as SEIU Local 888. Yeah, I did that intentionally. All right, very good. Let's take points of personal privilege before we go into executive session. So we'll go to Ms. Spada 4 first. I'll keep it very short. <laughs> Just a, a quick update. There, um, there is an early release um, this week, 1230 on Friday, early dismissal. Um, um, and I usually do BB updates, but obviously that is um, district. <laughs> um, the 7th is Thursday. There's going to be a Title I family Zumba night at 6 p.m. That was mentioned in the, um, the superintendent's report. Um, BB will also be having the second vaccine clinic, but I also believe we'll also be first back for first timers as well on the 13th of October. The 14th, we're going to be doing school pictures. Uh, the 18th of October is the BBPTO meeting via Zoom. And lastly, on October 22nd, will be the PTO Fall Festival at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Batafora. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to put out a notice that we are having a Halloween Fest festival in Trafton Park, everyone's welcome. Sunday, October 31st, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. We would love to have more volunteers to monitor games, candy, and contests. Please contact me for if you wish to volunteer, and we welcome everybody. This is for the entire city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Mr. Weldyke. I should also uh, echo Mr. Gray and say that uh, Councilor Murphy and I are hosting the annual, uh, well, it's not really something different. The annual is something different, but it's a pumpkin patch Halloween party uh, outdoors um, on Saturday, October 30th uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, at the Forestdale School. Thank you, Mr. Weldy. Anybody else? If not, we'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. Motion by Ms. Spadafora, seconded by Mr. McCarthy. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Drummond? Here. Mr. Freuer? <laughs> Mr. Gray? Yes. Mr. Avina? Yes. Ms. Luong? Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Ms. Spadafora? Yes. Mr. Walden? Yes. Mayor Christmas? Yes. We now go into executive session.
All right, everybody, we're back. We'll entertain any motions. Uh, Mr. Ivino. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Profit. Oh, okay. I'd like to make a motion to uh, motion that the uh, chairman of the school committee is authorized to sign the memor of a memorandum of agreement between the Malden School Committee and the Paraprofessionals Union. All right. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Long. Any questions on it? You've seen it. Reviewed it. Hearing none, we'll have the... Clerk will call the roll. So, Mr. Drummond? Present. Um, okay. Mr. Troyer? That means yes. <laughs> John, you there? Well, we tried. Just go with it. Okay, maybe we'll wait. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Ayavina? Yes. Ms. Luong? Yes. Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Ms. Padapora? Yes. Mr. Wambay? Yes. Mayor Christensen? Yes. Mr. Troy? Okay, that carries. Now we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion by Mr. Drummy, seconded by Ms. Spadafora. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? The ayes have it. That carries unanimously. <laughs> the school committee is hereby adjourned. Recording stopped. Oh, look at